Hello, and welcome to Colloquiopedia. Hello, and welcome to Colloquiopedia, the all new short, sharp weekly show in which we take a popular word or phrase from the cultural zeitgeist and attempt to understand it in a little bit more layman's terms thus making the complex more comprehensible. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about DEI, diversity, equity and inclusion, or diversity, equality and inclusion, depending on your specific interpretation, uh, which to an extent can just depend on which side of the pond you're looking at it. I'm delighted to say we've got a great guest in Ali Jackson Jolly who's an assistant managing editor at Forbes magazine, dealing a lot in the area of DEI. I actually spoke to Ali yesterday and we're going to jump into that conversation momentarily. But just before we do, I wanted to have a look at the term uh, in its purest form in the text of how we might be expected to interpret DEI today. And the Cambridge Dictionary definition is that DEI is the idea that all people should have equal rights and treatment and be welcomed and included so that they do not experience any disadvantage because of belonging to a particular group and that each person should be given the same opportunities as others according to their needs. That's the theory anyway. We'll all no doubt have our own interpretations as to how that's applied and interpreted in practice, whether that's in the workplace or in wider society. And there are some fascinating uh, etymological, you know, like historical uh, things to analyze about this term and the way that it's grown up. It actually originates from uh, affirmative action, which itself largely we think originates from uh, President John F. Kennedy. And when you start thinking about terms that have evolved from maybe other words, definitions, phrases that we're kind of using today on an everyday basis, uh, obviously it's just kind of fascinating really. But that is enough rambling from me. So without further ado, let's jump into that conversation with Ali. So, Ali, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. And, um, well, thanks for being here. And if you could just start, really, by uh, introducing yourself, Forbes, the brand at large, maybe a bit of the specifics of uh, what you do there, how you got there, and your DEI-focused day-to-day. Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. So, as you mentioned, I'm Ali Jackson-Jolly. I'm an assistant managing editor I oversee DEI initiatives for Forbes, the Forbes newsroom. So diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we've recently. Um, oh, can I just stop you there off the bat? Uh, you said equity rather than. In fact, you know what? Keep going. We'll come back to that. But like, I want to ask you about that. The the difference between equity and equality. But sorry, continue. Sure, of course. Um, so I do this specifically for the Forbes newsroom, um, you know, in in the U.S. And, and to be honest, across most of the um, global media companies, um, our newsrooms don't necessarily reflect the audiences to whom we are talking and reporting for. And so... Um, you know, I was brought on to Forbes to do that. Um, a, a lot of it is thinking about um, recruiting, what we call a diversity pipelining. So creating big, robust pipelines of candidates that have more diverse perspectives um, via ethnicity and race, gender, um, able, able, you know, thinking about ableism um, and um, age. And so I also think about um, creating a community um, that keeps those diverse reporters and journalists. Um, so, you know, thinking about things like um, in community, environment, mentorship, um, career pathing, all of those things. Um, 
I also oversee our DEI content. Um, and by that, I like to think of myself as a air traffic controller, uh, which is to say that I sort of embed myself um, with the different executive editors and try to help them think about um, if the content that they are creating is thinking holistically about the audience um, that we're trying to reach. Um, much like a president, I do not think anyone should want to work in DEI for their entire career, or at least the kind of the DEI that I'm talking about, because, you know, I should be working to put myself out of business. And so by that, I think like, you know, when our newsroom looks like America and our global audiences, um, there won't be a need for someone like me that has to go embed in the different beats because, um, because the reporters will already be thinking about um, different, having different perspectives, um, having different diverse sources and all those kind of things. I'm already mega excited about this conversation and I already know that uh, we're going to completely run out of time of everything that I want to talk about. So uh, starting right at the very beginning and just focusing on those three letters, if I may, as a starting point, please. DEI, what does that mean to you? What is your definition, interpretation of that term in 2024? Yeah, so the way I think about it is um, DEI, when done well, is the um, effort to create more space and create um, um a way for voices that are historically um, marginalized, put in the margins, um, to have that space. So um, whatever those um, historically marginalized communities may be. I know, for example, um, in um, the UK, um, there's different ideas and different communities that may have been historically marginalized. Um, in the US, obviously, it is very um, prominently the Black community, the Latino, Hispanic community, um, the Asian American Pacific Island com community, at least in terms of um, being well represented at different levels of the organization. Um, and, you know, so that's so so I think when it's done well, it's just an a, a, it's just a decision to make society better, to make industry better, to make um business better by creating that space for those communities. Excellent. And you've gone equity rather than equality there. Can you explain uh, maybe a slight difference or nuance between the two and why you go for one over the other maybe? Yeah. So, you know, we think about equity in terms of um, – well, first of all, I think it's appropriate because we're Forbes. So we think about, you know, resources and stuff like that. But, you know, it, in general, it, these buzzy words, DEI, and, you know, I know we're going to talk about that later, so I can't wait to do that. Um, there's been um, a rea uh, understanding, it used to be only diversity, right? And then there was... Um, I think a, a understanding from society or that that diversity isn't enough. Like that's not that we're not thinking about it well enough. If we just say diversity, and then it was diversity and equity. Sorry, equality. So are we? You know, are are there equal? Um, are we allowing for um, equal voices? Right, say in the newsroom. Um, but then there is this this real this realization that. Um, equality isn't the same thing as equity because equity is sort of understanding that there may be some barriers that that disallow us to say okay you know like we're going to create a newsroom that um that exactly replicates our readership um go but like that's not realistic right because we know that there are um, there are barriers, barriers including like our own internal things, like maybe our networks are filled with people who um, don't represent those those more um, historically underrepresented groups. Um, barriers in like if our if our main um, pipeline is colleges, are there fewer um, 
black and brown journalism students in universities. So is so equity is just sort of that larger view that we need to understand what the resourcing is and and pay attention to that. And and there may be different kind of levers that we need to pull um, to create um, more diversity, equity, and then inclusion, of course, just means that everyone feels like they have, you know, just because you have a newsroom or a, a company or a, you know, a industry that looks diverse, is there space for, is there an inclusive environment so voices um, can be used so that people are empowered to use their voices? Yeah, I'm a big fan of, uh, as you probably gathered, the, the equity rather than the equality, like being a little bit obsessed with words and just like nuances and like syntax and lexicology or whatever it is and like the etymology of words and terms like I like that it it just it I think more broadly we've gone from the equality part to the equity part and it seems like such a tiny little you know throwaway thing but like if we're like really mindful about our words and our phrases I think that really helps to like actually sculpt the meaning that we draw out of stuff just by sometimes subtly changing, you know, that language. Um, now, can we jump into this, please? Uh, you know, never go into ongoing cases or, you know, that's what they tell you in the journalism school. So, you know, we can, we can delve into the, uh, the intricacies or the broad concepts, you know, whichever end of the spectrum you want to sit on there. I, just to give you a bit of background on this, I was, my mind was absolutely boggled when all the stuff kicked off with the Harvard professor towards the end of last year. And suddenly Elon Musk was jumping in about it on the Twitter. You know, I, I understand that side of things. I understand that there are people that operate in this world and they operate solely, you know, to trade on kind of uh, fear and sensationalism and there's clicks in that, right? And there's likes and there's engagement and so on. But I had never, I don't think I had ever seen the phrase DEI kind of weaponized in that way in my life, whereby Elon Musk and some of his followers and stuff were saying, it's a bad term, you shouldn't use it. It's negative. Like, to my mind, it's like, it's absolutely mind-blowing. That's something that's actually got equality or equity in the actual written language. Anyone could ever say that that was against uh, kind of fairness and representation. I mean, I don't know if you saw that, what you thought oh, of it. Yeah, and no, of course. Like, past the popcorn, right? It's like lots of <laughs> drama, lots, for, lots of stuff for a journalist and an editor to write about. Um yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting. I th I've, I've been thinking about this in a couple of ways. Number one, I think it's the reason that a lot of people don't like to use the word, the term DEI versus saying those words out loud. Um, it's, it's similar to, you know, in the United States, there's this buzzy thing, BIPOC. I don't know if you use it there as well, but it's Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And it's sort of like, it takes the the um, meaning out of what you're reporting. It's easy. It's shorthand. Sometimes, you know, as a reporter or editor to have to write that out, it's like a little longer and people get bored. On the other hand, um, you know, if you're talking about a Black American or a Black person and that and their race or ethnicity is relevant to that story, it's sort of... Um, takes it waters it down by using like alphabet soup BIPOC and I think the same thing is true for DEI I think um when you say oh I don't like DEI it kind of mean it has come to mean for those who are politicizing it or maybe those who have a very um you know very specific viewpoint on it um because it's it would be harder to say I'm against equity I mean, I'm against inclusion. I'm against diversity, right? But when you put them together, it kind of means something else. And so to your point about like being, you know, we're, we're, we're journalists, we're um, to, be, to be intentional about words. I think it's important to be intentional and understand that as well, um, that it's, you know, that, that words matter. And alphabet soup sometimes doesn't mean anything to anyone. Yeah. 
And do you think that in a weird way, that's acronym, right? That's when you put like three letters together or like letters together or whatever. Do you think in a way, like not just acronym, not just acronyms, but like stuff that takes a sort of broad identifier term that enables people to apply essentialist you know qualities and use it as you say in a way kind of not lazily but just as that kind of totem or that signifier of like oh this is broadly what we mean do you think that can sometimes hinder in a way more than help when when we try and, and contextualize and conceptualize and define things like that because it then allows people as I say to try and weaponize it or take it or turn it on its head or whatever yeah, I do. And I also think, I think the reverse of that is true too. Like, I think it is, it becomes something both bigger and smaller than it is, right? Um, it becomes more than just initiatives to create um, industries or newsrooms or society that has diversity, equity, and inclusion. It becomes something that is also um, something that maybe is, you know, thought of as in Elon Musk's case, um, something that is harmful to us, you know, to white men and to, um, according to Elon Musk, not necessarily according to the a API community, harmful to um, Asian Americans. Um, but it also becomes something like smaller than it is too. And, but I think on the flip side, um, sometimes people use DEI um, to, um, to show a value to sort of say, oh, we're interested in DEI. Like, you know, come read Forbes because we're interested in DEI. Um, and, and so this is something that, you know, at Forbes we think really intentionally about, I think intentionally about as well, which is like, don't just throw those words up there. Make sure that you're um, thinking about, to go back to our initial conversation, why we're thinking about that. So for example, you know, I mentioned earlier, we just launched a platform call, called Forbes BLK. That is a platform that was specific and a community that was specifically um, created to empower Black entrepreneurs, uh, industry leaders, business leaders, um, there, we made the decision not to say this is like Forbes DEI or Forbes um, business people of color. Like we made a very specific decision to say, let's um, know what we're doing. Let's talk, you know, to, let's talk to this, empower this community, talk to this community. Um, and certainly there's often times to create that intersectionality, but there's also times to like, just be very specific about what you're talking about when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion. And so I think that, yes, the, 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 you know, Elon Musk's or Bill Ackman's of the world have, you know, used their very big platform to demonize DEI. But I think honestly, on the other end of the spectrum, some industry has sort of used it to, um, to, um, I guess, code, be a code word for, you know, um, doing this value that they think um, just by putting it out there means that they're doing the right thing. And I think, you know, I think that I'm really proud of the work we do at Forbes. I think that um, we are honest with ourselves about um, why we're doing it. And and the other thing is about Elon, I just want to say this quickly about Elon Musk. Um, I'm a bit of an optimist. I, I do not think you can be in the change business unless you are. Um, the fact that Elon Musk and the Bill Ackman's and other folks are all of a sudden um, super worried about DEI says to me we're doing something right, right? Because um, change is painful. To, you know, I, I, I before I was in journalism, I was I was in government affairs. I worked on Capitol Hill. Um, I worked around in an area around um, creating more. Uh, opportunities for women business owners. And like I always said, if change was easy, we'd all do it. But change is hard for everyone. Usually when you're creating change, somebody is like, you're saying somebody's going to move around a little bit. Um, if Elon Musk wasn't thinking about this, if there weren't some folks that weren't thinking about it, I would say we're not doing anything. So the fact that post um, 2020, um, when George Floyd was murdered in America um, at the hands of police officers, um, 
a lot of industry, including my industry, changed things in a very um, intentional way, in a way it hadn't been done before. And I think that what we're seeing in part, you're right, it's some of it is like just because it's good drama and to get more clicks, but some of it is understanding that when you make change, there's pushback. And when you see pushback, you know there is some change being that's happening. That's the optimist in me, though. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, that isn't even necessarily like mega sort of like, you know, tap your heels and you're at home, like, you know, really, or even that positive. I think that's just quite realistic. I think it's good. One thing that I'm interested to ask you on the point of change and how difficult it is and stuff like that, and uh, interject if at any point I just sounds like completely crazy, but my view of the media tech industry and the way it's grown up over the last sort of 10, 15 years is that, you know, it, it was a technology that kind of decentralized uh, communications and media and conversation and thought leadership away from, you know, say the centralized bodies of state or large organizations. And it put the means of production to use a Northern British, you know, phrase into the hands of the people. They could go and create content, distribute it themselves, all of that. Do you think because of the world that that, helped to create and the more globalized and maybe you know although correct me if i'm wrong potentially more inclusive world as we got into the, the new millennium do you think there has been a bit of a backlash to that from sort of the old world order as it may be in terms of like patriot patriarchal systems or large organizations wanting to control you know not even say say the people or the inclusion or whatever, but even just the dialogue and the narrative. Do you think people who were used to the old ways have resented that? And we've had to fight maybe really even harder over the last five or 10 years to, um, to, to broaden things out in the way that we kind of initially wanted to. Oh, that's a good question. All right. I know. <laughs> that is quite big. I mean that, you know, and then also tell me about, you know, what the universe is, but no, you get me. It's like, uh, from the broader point of view, or even if we just look at it from a from a media point of view and a media tech point of view as kind of journalists and editors, like you understand what I mean about those wider macro trends. It feels like we've been on one one heck of a roller coaster <laughs> over the last decade or two. Yeah, no, you're right. And the you know, the media business, wow, right? Because media means so many different things. Like I tend to think of like journalism and newsrooms, but like the media is much larger than that. And um yeah, I think that we are in a moment in which um, uh, I, I, yes, I would agree with what you said. I think we're in a moment in which there are some, um, um, I guess, power dynamics happening, you know, but I also think it's, you know, just the state of the media that everyone that has an opinion can voice that opinion um, and those that are very good at growing an audience can voice that opinion um, sometimes as if it's fact. Um, and so, and, and yet, you know, I, uh, of course, as a journalist, fully believe that people have a right to say those things. Like, you know, yeah. Elon Musk has a right, his first amendment right to, you know, say what he thinks. Um, you know, I, I think that it's the media's job to, so to, you know, do story to do some reporting and storytelling around that. Um, I think that, um, you know, I guess the other thing I think that's the, that was, the, wow, that is that, that conference, by the way, that point right there, I think is like a series of 10 of these because there's so much to unpack here. I mean, we probably need a couple of media um, academics with us to help us unpack it as well. But, um, you know, the thing I think about, if I'm just going to go back to like the pushback from, you know, whether it's the affirmative action case and um, the, the, um, that the U.S. Um, Supreme Court just addressed um, for higher education in which they said that there was no longer um, 
universities were no longer allowed to ask specifically, uh, make decisions on ethnicity and race. Um, to Elon Musk's, um, you know, conversations about how the evils of DEI to Bill Ackman, billionaire Bill Ackman's, um, you know, conversations in the media. You know, like the thing that I say to most people, it's what Forbes believes, it's what I believe, is in addition to doing things because they're the right thing to do, um, companies that don't get this right, I don't believe they'll be around by 2045. 2045 is the year that America will be made up of more people of color than white people. Um, and, um, you know, I think that for, I'll speak very specific to media companies and newsrooms. If, if you understand that your audience will look more diverse than non-diverse and you're not working to create a newsroom that can tell stories for for that diverse audience, you're not going to be around in 20 years because nobody's going to read you. Because I firmly believe that viewers, audiences, readers understand authenticity and um, and um, will not read, will not put up with, will not like have an appetite for businesses, for products, for um, for for news that doesn't reflect them and i and i and i believe that i mean i think that there's a business case you know so what i mean i care but so what if you don't care about society i care but um but the businesses are going to lose that don't get that and i firmly believe that i think that that is a, a supremely wonderful answer uh by the way uh, just in terms of like you know look <laughs> uh, these are the facts like these are the trends and and that's you know that's how it's going to be uh as you say this could be like another 10 episodes just talk about this one topic so just to move more back i guess to kind of you know more the b2b rather than just talking about the consumer side and we look at media and business more broadly i mean is it the case also that without that diverse uh, pool of talent and opinions and perspectives you are almost certainly just going to get overtaken because you just aren't going to see the next wave of change coming you know if you've just got that very blinkered view with uh you know very uh undiverse workforce you are going to lose out from a business and a corporate point of view aren't you because you just you're going to lose touch with reality a little bit. Yeah, I think that's really true. I think that's so smart. I think you know, it, you know, if we want to take it beyond race and gender and ethnicity, that's sort of what the media that was under the gun for um, a couple of years ago when um, there was conversation about the the um, coastal elites, right? And where are, where are many of our large newsrooms? They are... And, and um, by the way, just, just to interject on that, as a, as a Brit, I didn't really necessarily even comprehend the full magnitude of the term left behind over here. Over here, left behind would be like more of a purely theoretical term in terms of what people go and do as their vocation or what they study or whatever. But my friend was telling to me about the change in demographics of kind of like, um, you know, Central America versus people living on the coasts. And it's like actually physically people are moving away to those urban centers now. And and so in a way, like you try and empathize, you can see why people see those physical shifts, people actually physically leaving their towns and cities and they they may see you know, that much change. And, and I suppose it can be quite a lot in a way. Yeah, no, I think that's, and I think it's like, you're, you're exactly right. And that was one where it was like, you're, you're so right. We could see, we can continue to see that shift happening. But I think that um, it sort of speaks to the danger of having like this echo chamber, right? So like, again, why diversity writ large matters to newsrooms. Um, if you don't have different diverse voices from different parts of the country, from different parts of the globe, if your audience is global, as Forbes is, um, from different, you know, um, 
religions, from different races, from different ethnicities, then you're going to be in this echo chamber and you're not going to have the ability to um, move your business in the way it, you know, your audience would like it to, to you know, the what your audience is asking for or would ask for if they could. And so like, you know, there's a ton of, as I'm sure you know, research around that, um, that shows that businesses, newsrooms, media companies, and businesses are better when they have more diverse voices. And so, um, yeah, I just like, like I said, um, I hope I'm not doing this in five years from now. I hope in five years, I, I believe, I actually really truly believe that the Forbes newsroom, um, we're doing some really interesting, innovative things. I think I will work myself out of a job in five years. Um, but I think that um, I'm just well, waiting for the rest of the company, the country to the rest of the world to catch up. Yeah, I would say knock on wood, but I don't want to like tempt fate of you out of a job. So, you know, maybe win-win either way. I know. I got I to get my two college kids through college first, so I'm kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> just to bring it back to Forbes at the end then, and just because I want to name drop that I uh, interviewed your CEO. Is it Mike Federl? Is that how you say it? Federl? Oh, uh, no. Mike Federley. Oh, Federley. Oh, well, I mega apologize, by the way. Uh, for that. But uh you know, I remember talking to him, I think I mentioned to you just before the pandemic, and there was a big emphasis then at that time of moving away from kind of traditional, the traditional corporate sense of business and into kind of more startup entrepreneurial mentality, which, which I think kind of sits with the growth of more DI and uh, more inclusive and, and diverse workforces and ideas, probably goes hand in glove a little bit with sustainability as well and mm -hmm. more the idea of community-driven capitalism. Mm -hmm. you know? But is that something that Forbes have really embraced, like the different nature of business now and, and the different maybe interpretations or definitions of how we might think of someone as a business person or an entrepreneur or whatever it may be? Yeah, that's a good question. And yes, the answer is yes. Um, the thing that's really fun about working at Forbes, I've been here for about four years now. Um, I've worked, I've had many different um, careers in many different kinds of companies. And I've always said this one feels like a startup. Um, you know, we have entrepreneurial capitalism at, at our roots and that's what it feels like. And I think in that it is um, shifting towards um to your point, um, the understanding that there are that the idea of who is an entrepreneur or, or who embraces entrepreneurial capitalism today may be different than who um, we thought about in the past. You know, we launched um, we've launched a couple of um, communities that show that. For one, we have a creators community, um, which is like you know really understanding that creators or people who are on social media platforms um that do it so well that they are wealth builders or entrepreneurs um you know another thing is we highlight a lot of these founders um who say especially in this day and age with the media landscape um that when you're an entrepreneur you're often two things you're the ceo of your company whatever that may be and you're a media um, you're the CEO of your media brand, right? And so I think that that is, you know, there is this understanding that um, the old, the old, yeah, I guess, I don't know, historical uh, vision of what a wealth builder was or what a entrepreneur or, or industry leader was is changing and will continue to change. And, um, and isn't that exciting? It really is. Uh, it's uh, again, it's a topic in and in and of itself. The way, the nature, the way things have changed. You know, from going to kind of individuals and collaboration and so on. And uh, that's the next part of the more the B two B side that I look forward to watching. Uh, Ali Jackson Jolly, thank you very much for your time today. Yeah, I've loved being here. Thanks for having me. And I can I look forward to continuing to watching your um interesting conversations. Um, <laughs> you pick good topics. The ramblings of a madman. But that's very nice of you to say. Thank you very much.